Hi, welcome to this talk on the microcirculation, which is part of a series of talks centered around rational fluid prescribing. My name is Ashley Miller, and I'm a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care medicine. Before I start, I'd like to thank the Association of Anaesthetists for inviting me to follow up my previous education shot on the macro circulation. Before we go into more detail, it's important to realise that there are different types of capillaries. There are specialised ones in the liver, kidneys and gut that have specific functions I'm not going to go into. The ones that interest us for this talk are the most abundant. These are non-sinusoidal, non-fenestrated capillaries that are found in muscle, skin, connective tissue, lungs and our brains. And we're going to look at how the structure of these capillaries influences IV fluid prescribing and vasopressor use. In medical school, I learned about the Starling model to explain fluid flow across capillaries. And this was the general concept. Here we have a capillary containing red blood cells, plasma and albumin. Capillaries have an arterial and venous end and are lined with endothelial cells. And these cells have gaps in between them with interstitial tissue on the other side of the cells. In muscle, connective tissue in the lungs, these gaps are frequent and large. And in the brain, they're infrequent and small, which we know as the blood-brain barrier. And I was taught that there's a hydrostatic pressure gradient from the capillaries to the interstitium, down which fluid leaks at the arterial side of the circulation, and an opposing colloid osmotic pressure gradient that draws fluid back into the vessels at the venous end. Any excess fluid is returned to the circulation in the great veins by the lymphatics. But we now have a better understanding of this fluid flux in what is known as a revised or extended Starling principle. We now know that capillaries are lined by a spongy layer called the glycocalyx. This contains water in a gel phase. It's tricky to measure, but it probably contains about one litre of the intravascular volume, which, as it's in a gel phase, is not free-flowing like the rest of the plasma. In contrast to what I learned in medical school, we now know that capillary pressures just exceed colloid osmotic pressures down their length. And this means that filtration of fluid from the vessels to the interstitium occurs down the whole length of capillaries at arterial and venous ends. No fluid is reabsorbed back into the capillaries. It is all removed by the lymphatics. Now, albumin has an important role in all of this. The glycocalyx traps albumin in its outer layer, but it's able to cross into the interstitium through occasional large gaps. And in fact, 60% of albumin is located in the interstitial space, while only 40% is found in the plasma. Like the plasma filtrate, it is also taken back to the circulation via lymphatics. The jet of water molecules passing through the small pores prevents much protein diffusing back up the endothelial clefts to the underside of the glycocalyx. So the colloid osmotic pressure gradient across the glycocalyx is significant and exists between the plasma and the relatively protein-free endothelial clefts. The significance of this is that it limits filtration to just a few mils a minute with the plasma volume leaving the circulation once every nine hours. There is an exception to this though. When capillary pressures become very low, for example in acute hypovolemia, hydrostatic pressure falls and the colloid osmotic pressure gradient now exceeds hydrostatic pressure, which causes flow from the interstitium back into the plasma. This is only transient, however, as protein molecules diffuse back up to the subglycocalyx space, thus abolishing the oncotic pressure gradient and stopping reabsorption. In clinical practice, this transient reabsorption 
allows about 500 mLs of fluid back into the circulation before this ceases. It is in effect a protective mechanism in hypovolemia. Now remember I said filtration normally occurs at pretty low levels because of the high colloid osmotic pressure gradients across the glycocalyx. And we can plot this on a graph of filtration by capillary pressure. As well as the filtration rate being low, the increase in filtration with increasing capillary pressures is also initially low, as you can see here with the relatively flat line. And this is because as flow of fluid through the endothelial clefts increases, the small amount of albumin there is washed out, so the oncotic pressure gradient opposing filtration increases. Once though all the albumin has been washed out, there can be no further increase in the colloid osmotic pressure gradient and filtration rapidly increases. This transition point is known as the J point. With normovolemia, capillary pressures are fairly close to the J point in this sort of region. So how is all this relevant clinically? Well, let's see what happens when we give IV fluid in different situations. In normovolemia, infusion of crystalloid will raise capillary pressures. And as normovolemia lies close to the J point, the result will be increased filtration of fluid from the vessels into the interstitium. And up to a point, this will be taken care of by increased lymphatic flow. In hypovolemia, compensatory vasoconstriction lowers capillary pressures and filtration out of vessels ceases, and this state is far to the left of the J point. As you resuscitate the patient, the infused fluid will be retained in the vessels until the capillary pressure of the J point is exceeded. So if the patient is hypovolemic, any fluid you give will be retained in the vessels until you reach euvolemia. So all that stuff about a third of any saline you give staying in the circulation and two thirds leaving it is not really true. Or at least it depends on what your capillary pressures are to start with. So even 5% glucose will stay in the circulation when there is hypovolemia. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this as you should be replacing like for like, but it is worth mentioning. After all, without IV fluid, we can replenish plasma volume simply by drinking water. What about if we infuse too much fluid and cause hypervolemia? Well, here the J point can be exceeded enough to overwhelm lymphatic return and edema results. Now we get onto something really important about which there are some big misconceptions. What about leaky capillaries, which always seem to be given such emphasis in sepsis? Well, fluid leak, remember, occurs all the time, albeit it's usually at a fairly low level. Inflammatory states such as sepsis increase the rate significantly by damaging the glycocalyx and increasing capillary pressures. This has been confirmed by studies showing that the albumin escape rate increases from around 5% an hour in health to 15% in septic shock. This means that the curve is effectively moved to the left, so that for a given capillary pressure, more filtration is occurring. The implications of this are misunderstood, however. The same study demonstrating increased albumin escape rates in sepsis identified many patients with similar amounts of capillary leak who were simply post-op from relatively minor surgery or who were sitting on cancer wards. All were well and none of them were edematous. We see this in septic patients when they first present to hospital. None of them are edematous either. They often are later, after four litres of IV fluid, but not before this is given. Lymphatic return is able to deal fairly easily with the levels of increased filtration you get in sepsis. It seems you have to be some way to the right of this graph with high capillary pressures or complete endothelial failure to become edematous. And this means that septic patients 
and not hypovolemic. It is only in states of massive capillary leak, like the very rare Clarkson's disease or anaphylaxis, that hypovolemia can result from leaky capillaries. And these patients crucially have two things in common on presentation. They have edema and high hematocrits. Septic patients and patients with pancreatitis don't. So, does this mean then that leaky capillaries aren't important? Certainly not. Bear in mind I said that sepsis moves the curve left. And while this is not enough to cause overwhelming fluid leak by itself, if you raise capillary pressures with IV fluid, especially if you give it quickly, this combined with increased leakiness overwhelms the system. And this is borne out by evidence that shows us that while 15% of a crystalloid bolus remains in the circulation after three hours in a healthy volunteer, only 5% remains in a septic patient after as little as 30 minutes. So if you give a septic or pancreatitic patient a litre of saline or Hartmann's, 950 mils of it will be in their interstitium in less than an hour. So what do we do then if our septic or pancreatitic patient is hypotensive? We know that they're not hypovolemic and we know that any IV fluid we give them will just leak out. Thankfully, vasopressors, by their alpha agonist action, as well as increasing blood pressure, actually reduce capillary pressures and therefore filtration and edema. Now, some of you will be wondering how albumin administration fits in here. And while you could fill a whole lecture on albumin, I'll just mention a couple of points. It may be that 20% hyperoncotic albumin can cause a transient reabsorption of fluid, just like happens with hypovolemia. But remember that in health, 60% of albumin wakes its way into the tissues and that this increases with leaky capillaries. It's therefore likely to make edema worse rather than better. And we have loads of evidence that albumin provides no real benefit in critical illness. So until proved otherwise, I think the only thing albumin is good for is wasting your hospital's money because it's expensive. I'm going to finish off by talking a little bit about fluid compartments. The traditional thinking about where IV fluids are distributed is a bit simplistic. And it goes something like this. There's an extracellular volume made up of the plasma volume and the interstitial volume and an intracellular volume regulated by the sodium potassium pump. And we traditionally taught that colloids are retained in the plasma volume, that salty fluid equilibrates throughout the ECF, and that water distributes throughout the total body water. In actual fact, it's a bit more complicated than this. As we talked about earlier, we now know intravascular fluid consists of about three liters of three free flowing plasma and maybe one liter of non-flowing fluid contained in the glycocalyx. The interstitium can be divided into expansile and non-expansile regions. Interstitial compartments such as those encased in bone like brain and bone marrow and those encased by capsules such as the kidney, liver and spleen cannot be expanded easily. And this means that salt solutions have a lower volume of distribution than is often taught, around seven rather than 14 liters. And the interstitium also has an aqueous phase and a gel phase. The aqueous phase is usually around 1% by volume, but increases massively in edema. This aqueous fluid is returned to the circulation by lymph. So, how is this relevant and where does infused fluid actually go? The slightly annoying answer is that it depends and it is all of course time dependent. All fluid will be in the vessels immediately after it's given whereas the entire plasma volume is circulated through the lymphatics every nine hours. Colloids go to the free-flowing plasma volume and are excluded from the glycocalyx which explains why data shows that the ratio of colloid to crystalloid to correct hypovolemia 
is about 1.3 to 1. It also means colloids dilute to hematocrits more than crystalloids and that they dehydrate the glycocalyx. So colloids are very slightly better at restoring free-flowing plasma volume than crystalloids, but not by much, and of course they cause their own problems. Crystalloid, on the other hand, goes into the plasma and glycocalyx volume, and where it goes from there depends on capillary pressures. As we saw earlier, if there's hypovolemia and low capillary pressures, all crystalloid or colloid will stay intravascularly until normovolemia is achieved and the J point is reached. Once you've restored uvolemia and capillary pressures are normal, any extra crystalloid will flow into the interstitium and about 85% of it will be interstitial after three hours. And remember that with high capillary pressures and leaky capillaries, studies show that 95% of infused crystalloid is interstitial in around 30 minutes. So when a patient's not hypovolemic, most of the fluid you give just expands the interstitium and causes edema. A small volume of fluid does of course stay in the vessels. And enough of this will dilate the compliant right heart, which increases in volume along with the great veins. Once its compliance is overwhelmed, venous pressures increase significantly, causing even more capillary leak and edema, as well as compromising organ perfusion, which is the subject of another talk in this series. Now, one curious thing is that fairly recently it's been identified that there is a non-osmotic sodium store in the interstitium, particularly in the skin. It probably has a role in fine-tuning the extracellular fluid volume in that it can take up or release sodium as required. This means that a couple of litres of 5% glucose is less likely to lead to hyponatremia than might be imagined, as sodium from this store can be released. It also means that edema after a couple of litres of saline may be prevented by taking the sodium up into this store. It might also be a protective mechanism to the massive doses of salt that a Western diet provides to limit ECF expansion. We don't really know yet. And finally, we now know that the intracellular fluid volume is also not as straightforward as previously thought. There is evidence to suggest that ICF volume is auto-regulated over a range of body water osmolalities. It's been speculated that the cells can generate or clear osmolites to regulate their fluid volume even in the face of hypo or hypertonic fluid infusion. The implications of this are that extracellular edema can occur with no increase in ICF volume. Also, hypotonic fluids may dilute the ECF more than expected rather than swelling the intracellular fluid volume. This will also depend on non-osmotic sodium stores in the interstitium and the pre-existing volume of the intracellular fluid. So it's complicated and further work needs to be done to investigate this and its clinical implications. So in summary, Filtration occurs down the whole length of capillaries. Any infused fluid stays in the vessels in hypovolemia, but causes edema when there is not hypovolemia. Sepsis and pancreatitis don't cause hypovolemia and we should use vasopressors, not fluids for these. Fluid distribution is more complicated than we thought and just like the macrocirculation, the microcirculation works best at uvolemia. Thanks for listening and watch out for the next talk in the series on organ perfusion.